Hi everyone, my name is Alex, I'm an engineer and my passion is design, development and prototype production of all sorts of engineering solutions. Yeah, and, and the occasional reconditioning and repairs that come along the way, I'm guessing. <laughs> so in this episode I wanted to share with you some findings that I could gather over the years concerning the reconditioning of machine tool paint. And by this I don't mean the conserv conserving and polishing of old machine tool paint, but rather I mean paint stripping and completely repainting machine tool parts to a smooth surface finish uh, like it was done in the old days. Now painting machine tool parts usually means painting rough cast iron pieces. And so this type of paint job differs significantly in some instances from, for example, the typic uh, typical car body work, car body paint work. And in this episode I will po point out the, the significant differences and how you can use those differences to your advantage when you're do, doing wor uh, such work. Now, I already hear you saying it. I already hear you saying, Alex, you're stupid, why would you invest so much work, prep work and so much care in a paint job of machine tool parts which will scratch and wear down eventually anyways. So, yeah, I know, it's a good point, but I've got three reasons. Reason number one is, the machine tools and the accessories I own, they are reconditioned to a standard that I dare to call good as new when they left production or at least good as new, how they left production. So I also want them to look like they just left production back in the day, because you know how people are. They come to your shop, they see some worn down machine tool paint and assume that the machine is as worn down as the paint. Yeah, it's a fair assumption, but it's just not true in the case at hand. So that's why I, why I, like, to, why I like my stuff also to look new. The second reason is, the smooth surfaces, yes, they require a lot of work for paint prepping them, but they just clean nicely. And you know what? I paint once, but I clean the rest of my life. So I'd rather have an, a, an easy cleaning job than an easy painting job. So that's reason number two for me. And the third reason is, it's the most important one. You know, it, it just uh, eases the pain to know that I've painted it properly the pain in my brain pan when I go to sleep at night. It's science. And my, my grandmother used to, yeah, she, she used German language, but she used to say it, it, it is to put the poor soul to rest. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, in case you wonder why I chose gray color, it's not to match my, my stylish tracksuit here. It is uh, rather because it uh, contrasts nicely with the uh, light gray paint on my WF mill and so the accessories with this dark gray they match it nicely and contrast it nicely so it's it, it's not a fashion call it's just a <laughs> it's just a contrasting call I'm guessing so if you're interested in this sort of work uh, join me why not all right of course we start with paint stripping now the technique I really favor over all the others on these cast iron parts is to just plainly use the flat scraper. First I beat the surface with the flat scraper in order to, to chip off rough uh, and big chunks of the paint and then I scrape away the remainder with the scraper blade. Simple as that. Now, of course, you could use different methods, like you could use the wire wheel, you could use the needle scaler, or you could sandblast it, or you could even try to chemical strip it, or although it's a nasty job, and I believe it might not have the biggest success with the thick layers we're talking about here. But all these other methods, they more or less damage the adjacent functional surfaces. While the flat scraper can be used very precisely and very locally, of course you have to have some practice with it, but the, the damage that you inflict on the adjacent functional surfaces with the scraper is really minimal. Also, the scraping method 
requires really no consumables, none at all. Uh, this this might be important for the cheap guys among you, like I am. <laughs> and uh, another benefit is you don't need dust extraction. There is no airborne dust. There is only coarse chips and some coarser dust which can be uh, cleaned up with a broom. That's all there is. So I like this method a lot. The scraper I use here has a carbide blade insert which is kind of nice because it doesn't ever need resharpening while I strip this whole part here. You may also be able to get away with using a high speed steel scraper but you may have to resharpen it from time to time I'm guessing. In concave areas sometimes the triangular scraper is a better choice for paint removal, but uh, that's something you have to try for yourself. So next is cleaning the oily remnants from the oil bath on the inside of the part. So uh, because I don't want to spread it all over and over the to be painted surfaces when I handle the part. I use brake cleaner and just some cotton rags to do this. I favor the cotton rags over the painter paper cloth because the, the cotton rags, they don't tend to fuzz up the, the, the rough cast iron surface so much as the paper towels do. Next is cleaning up the casting itself. Uh, mostly this concerns uh, casting defects and remnants from the parting plane in the casting mold. So the stuff I'm using here is just the, the die grinder and the angle grinder, mostly with the flat the hard graphing disk because um, this allows you to more precisely create flat surfaces quite in contrast if you were using the, um, the, the flapper disk for example. Best judge for this work is simply the trained flat hand because it lets you feel very precisely feel all the bumps and valleys that remain on the surface that you may want to get rid of and this serves mainly one purpose, to get the final paint layer as thin as possible while still being smooth. Final check is also done with the hand, just feeling for a smooth surface. Maybe I should call it the paw leather, I'm not sure. Here I'm removing a remainder from the parting plane. Um, this area would otherwise require a lot of filler to build up for a smooth surface. So I'd rather remove the imperfection of the cast iron than build up so, so much filler here. Next is degreasing the to be masked surfaces and masking it for the first filler step. But we don't have to go crazy with the masking here because there are three steps following. The first one is brush on fill primer, the second one is spray on fill primer and the third one is paint. So this first step we only mask what we don't want to hit with the brush but we don't have to mask for example the bottom, bottom side of the part here. Here I'm using that triangular scraper to cut the masking tape on the edges. Uh, I prefer this over using the knife blade because the scraper is a little more resilient towards dulling from the rough surface of the cast iron. Also masking the holes, the bigger ones are easy and the smaller ones I plug with the poor man's plugs.
This here again is uh, plugging the threaded holes with uh, poor man's uh, masking plugs. <laughs> I'll show you how these are made later on in the video. <laughs> Now this is cleaning the part before we apply the brush on fill primer. I'm using silicone cleaner here and just cotton rags. Cotton rags for the same reason because I don't want to fuzz up the rough surface so much. And uh, the important thing here is to frequently change your rag. Uh, you can use the forward and the back, backward side of the rag but you have to frequently change it so as to make sure to really remove the grease and not just spread it evenly over the part. So next we have to apply three wet on wet layers of fill primer. Now this may be called a different name where you live or with the products that you use. It may be called high buildup primer, it may be called filler, it may be called fill primer. But all it is is it is a product from the automotive industry, an acrylic based two component product that is resin and hardener. And it provides very good adhesion properties on the steel and at the same time it also provides very good filling properties and sanding properties. Usually this product is intended to be applied with the spray gun but on our rough cast iron pieces I much rather begin with this first step with a paint brush because this way it's much easier to close pores for example if there are pores on that casting and it's also much easier to work with that rough surface. With this product it's also quite easy to come up with a smoothish surface, quite in contrast if you were using putty and the putty knife, like it was done in the old days. A surface that has been created with the putty knife is much more difficult to sand than a surface that has been brushed on and is quite smoothish already. So these filler products are also much more easy to sand than for example filler putty and therefore I much rather do this with filler than the way they did it in the old days with putty and the putty knife so believe you me it's much simpler that way. This is not intended to badmouth the old days it's just that these modern filler products I just talked about they weren't available back in the old days. Here I'm checking if the previous layer is, is ready to receive the next one, so we are applying three layers. But the previous layers, they must be kind of tacky to receive the next one. That was too early. Yeah, this is good, this is good. So that's the surface after applying three wet on wet brushed on layers of fill primer. Here I'm demasking the areas which we otherwise could not properly sand, like these ones here with the plugs. And another important part of this step here is to chamfer back the filler at the edges where we meet functional surfaces. And I'll talk about the importance of that later in the video. Here I'm also chamfering the filler at the edge where it meets the bottom surface, but this time I'm, I'm not using uh, the, the knife for cutting, I'm using the knife for scraping. <laughs> it would be more elegant to use the scraper, but sometimes laziness has the upper hand. <laughs> So next we start the rough sanding process with some 240 grit abrasive. The product I'm using here is a 3M mesh type product. Works really nicely with the dust extraction and also it doesn't clog up or gum up so quickly. So I like it a lot. That's already smooth but I still keep going until I hit the first high spot.
Yeah, same here. That's the high spot. And here's the high spot. <laughs> yeah, who doesn't dream of a part that would finally come up? A part that you could only sand with the orbital sander, nothing else. <laughs> But tell you what, I believe it doesn't, it will never come up. <laughs> so on, on these parts, most of the sanding work is just hand work, plain old hand work. Some areas you may be able to cover with the orbital sander, and the others, the intricate parts, the curved parts, and so on, have to be done by hand. <laughs> if there is a shortcut that I don't know of, please tell me through the comments. <laughs> but I think it's uh, it's like walking through a river of mud doesn't help if you stop in the middle. You have to reach the other end. <laughs> of course in such work one tries to use as much tools as possible like uh, um, blocks or, or rulers or uh, rods or whatever whatever you have to to help smooth up the surface but in most cases it's just the fingers and <laughs> you, you you get aware of this when the fingernails become dangerously short <laughs> because the sandpaper also attacks the other side <laughs> it's boring but it's part of my life All right, that's the surface condition now after finished sanding the first three brushed on layers of fill primer. And the painters among you will say, ah, oh, Alex, you stupid amateur. You never sand through the fill primer. <laughs> and be that as it may with car bodies, but this case here is different. We have a cast iron piece with natural surface roughness. And that's why I like to divide the filler step into these two sub-steps, this pre-filler step and then the final filler step. And in this pre-filler step, I try to send through to the highest spots, and uh, but only very slightly. And as soon as I reach the highest spots, I continually move on to the next spots and so on. And this way I make sure that we end up with a paint layer that has the thinnest possible total thickness while still being a smooth layer. If, in contrast, we would build up a very high thickness of fill primer and only sand it until it's smooth, we may end up with spots that are very high buildup and are very, very prone to chipping or breaking off uh, some paint flakes if you hit it with something hard. The edges here I already scrape in this step, I already scraped the fill primer back so uh, so as to make sure that the, the filler does not protrude the, the edges and also that it's not flush with the edges but rather that it's chamfered, chamfered back. And this also makes sure that if you, if you place it on the machine table like so that the paint layer is not stressed but only the cast iron piece with the, the, the surface below. If the filler were to end uh, flush with the base surface and you place it like so on the machine table, you would immediately uh, chip off some paint here, which we want to avoid, of course. Now, this here is the only spot where I needed a little bit of filler putty, but this is only because I overlooked this, this area when I cleaned up the casting with the angle grinder. And this here is some remnant of the parting plane or parting surface from the mold. And yeah, I had to slightly fill it with some putty. What else? Yeah, mm, areas like this here, convex areas are really nasty to sand, or convex corners like this. But you have to take your time um, because you must make sure, for example, like here, not to sand too much through these edges here, which are much more prone to be sanded down. Yeah, that's the result.
um, spots like this here, I scrape out with the knife blade so that we have a very crisp corner. I'm not sure if you can see that properly on video, but uh, to make sure that we have a crisp corner that is a solid basis or solid foundation for properly masking this, uh, spraying a, the next layer of fill primer and then the final paint uh, without filling this in with, with filler or, uh, or color, which would look really unprofessional, in my opinion at least. <laughs> yeah, okay, so off we are for masking. Masking the part for the next uh, fill primer step, that's two layers of sprayed on fill primer. And then we check this last layer and sand it where necessary and then we put, off, put on the paint. So here I wanted to show you how I make these aforementioned um, uh, poor man masking plugs. Of course you could use some wire in this case or some, some bolt stuff, but uh, it's sometimes easier to just use the masking tape. Uh, I also cut it quite flush with the surface to uh, prevent shadowing when you spray. This may also be a hint for you. Sometimes I use the triangular scraper to cut the masking tape, particularly in areas like this one here with blunt edges. It works really nicely to drag the scraper blade in a sideward fashion over the edge and thereby share through the masking tape. It gives a really crisp crisp edge. So with freshened masking we can silicone clean the part again very thoroughly and next we apply uh, another two layers of spray on fill primer. This time of course the fill primer has thinner in it so that it has the appropriate viscosity for spraying. The first layer becomes tacky here so quickly, which I'm testing on the masking tape with the finger, that I can work uh, the second layer back to back onto the part. I'm using a 1mm nozzle in the SATA mini jet here with some RPS cups, I'm going to talk about the cups later in the video. And I'm using a quite narrow jet setting here. The uh, more regular painters may use a larger nozzle for filler work, but with all these details on that part, uh, it's more convenient for me to use a smaller nozzle. All right, let's look at the result of the uh, second fill primer step, uh, which is intended to reveal to us the last remaining imperfections to take care of by sanding, and uh, some areas which we still have to work at are, uh, I'm not sure if you can see this on video, it's hard to tell through the viewfinder, um, there is a slightly raised ridge that we have to sand down very carefully with a properly sized sanding block here also here and there these portions here we will take care of this next then all this looks really fine uh, this here is a good example for an area that's difficult to sand where we still have some Something to take care of. This here is a little raised and we will sand this down very carefully. And the rest looks... Uh, this here still is a little uneven and we will take care of this. And the rest looks really, really fine. All the other surfaces we will just um, give a a tiny kiss with the 400 grit sandpaper which should be fine uh, for good adhesion with the paint layer and yeah that's it so here I'm using 320 grit paper I didn't have any 400 grit paper left so that's what I've used here uh, along with some blocks and rods and, and all that uh, tools which help to smooth out the surface
Here I'm finishing this step with some red scotch brite. It helps a lot to smooth over the radii and um, uh, to create a more homogeneous surface condition prior to painting. Alright guys, so uh, this is the surface quality now after finish sanding the second fill primer step. Finish sanding it with 320 grit paper and scotch brite that is. And the scotch brite is used uh, to make sure that exposed portions of the part like this edge here or this one or this one or even this edge, uh, these portions they usually get scored deeper by the sandpaper than the flat portions. And uh, using the scotch brite, you can make sure that you have a very homogeneous preparation everywhere. Um, a very uh, nicely rounded corners or round the, rounded um, portions. And that everything is very well prepped to receive the paint. So I got rid of the imperfections we've discussed before, here and here, by using appropriately sized sanding blocks and sandpaper. And something I want to mention here is that in the second step, I always sand very slightly through the fill primer uh, where functional surfaces meet the painted surfaces, which is here, for example, or here, or here, and so on. And this is something that may not come up there, uh, for, uh, uh, in car body work. This is pretty typical, I think, for machine tool parts and uh, the intention behind it is, let me see to get rid of the glare. So the intention behind it is, if this is the part and this is the fill primer, which we've uh, um, scraped, uh, uh, which we've chamfered back by scraping or by sanding now, and uh, afterwards we paint it, let this be the paint. So this way we can make sure that firstly uh, the functional, uh, the, the paint where it meets the functional surfaces is not easily chipped off since it's chamfered back. And secondly, that the fill primer layer is not seen where these uh, painted surfaces meet the functional surfaces, but rather we only see paint all the way up to the edges. So that's why I sand through at all these um, at all these edges here. Okay, so we are prepped for paint. I freshened all the masking where necessary. I turned around the um, the masking of the table to make sure that no uh, primer flakes off and flies into the paint. I still have to do that over here, but then we should be ready to receive the paint. So let's see how that goes, and hopefully I don't mess it up. This final step. <laughs> the paint I'm using here is an acrylic top coat paint from Truck Repair. So uh, this type of paint consists of three components. That is resin with color pigment mixed according to your color specification, then hardener and the appropriate amount of thinner, which I judge with a technique that I show later in the video. And this is a really trouble-free and easy to work with type of paint. Uh, it's not so much drama as the base coat clear coat solutions which they use on the cars. It's very durable and, and, and I think it's the appropriate choice for our machine tools. The cups I'm using here are a SATA brand. They're called RPS cups. I'm not affiliated with those guys in any way. It's just the stuff I use and I think it's really good. Because these cups, they already have various mixing scales printed onto them. They have an integrated bottom filter, they have an integrated top valve, they come with a plug so that you can store stuff in it, like you see in the background, so that's convenient. And it's one-time use. Yes, they are not cheap, they cost about 2 euros per cup, but by using them you don't have to buy filters, uh, filter funnels anymore, you don't have to buy mixing cups anymore, you don't have to clean mixing cups, you don't have to clean a permanent cup and given the cost of solvent or paint thinner nowadays which is in my area about 10 euros per liter 
So um, it's it's more economical in my opinion to use those cups even though they are just one time use. So it's it's really convenient and you save a lot of time, you just have to clean the gun. So I scraped away the color from the 3 to 1 ratio scale here. That was necessary because this is some old stock paint I had from last year. Also the hardener is old stock, that's why it's so thick and viscous. But that doesn't affect the hardening quality, we just have to add more thinner, that's all. So here's adding the thinner and usually the manufacturer recommends a certain percentage of thinner but uh, you have to check for yourself even uh, particularly if you use old stock stuff like I am and the old school trick I'm using to judge the viscosity of the mix is to to see how it runs down from the mixing stick back into the cup and what you're looking for is that it almost starts to drop to form droplets but it still is a continuous stream of paint down back into the cup that almost wants to form droplets. Then you have the right viscosity. If the viscosity is too high, then your spray gun may start sputtering on you and you may not be able to come up with a decent smooth surface, surface finish. Well, on the other hand, if the, if the mix is too thin, you may have problems with runs in your paint job, which are also a big, big problem. So it's good to have the right viscosity here. Yeah, just take your time and don't rush it, like everywhere in life. Yeah, that should be good. This is that integrated bottom filter I was talking about in the RPS cups. And this is the way the cup connects with the gun, so um, there's a quick connector. And never forget to open the top valve when you start painting, otherwise you just draw a vacuum into the cup and don't get paint. Don't ask me how I know that! <laughs> Now one last silicone cleaner cycle, which may help to calm our nerves here, because we must not mess up the job with the last five minutes of work after all these hours of sanding and masking. <laughs> Don't ask me how I know that. <laughs> so I'm also using the one millimeter nozzle in a SATA mini jet here, and a quite narrow jet setting, because of all these intricate details on the part. And just take my time, but still be quick, because if you're not quick enough, you may end up with overspray in the part. And what we want to apply is, we want to apply two layers of color. And we apply the second layer after the first layer has become slightly tacky. So this is what I'm checking on the masking tape here. And here is the result. I guess this wraps it up. Thanks a lot for your interest in this video guys, I appreciate your time. I hope you found the one or the other thing in this video useful or maybe inspiring for one of your own projects. So see you in the next video, thanks!